Professor Bajaj, antibiotics have a distinct effect on the gut microbiota. Why is the effect of antibiotics sometimes paradoxical, especially in regards to liver cirrhosis? Thank you for asking that question. And liver cirrhosis is a specifically important problem because it's epidemic in the world. Alcohol, NAFL, hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And unfortunately, these patients come into the hospital over and over again. They are either given antibiotics because of hepatic encephalopathy for the treatment or the prophylaxis of infections. The paradoxical effect is because we do need antibiotics for certain specific, uh, specific reasons in cirrhosis, such as the prevention of uh, SBP, a recurrence of SBP, and after an upper GI bleeding, and also for treatment for infections. However, they are a double-edged sword. Because of this double-edged sword, they breed resistance, not only in the bacteria, they also lead to a collapse in the bacterial functionality in addition to the composition. And last but not the least, they encourage the overgrowth of fungal uh, species that result in fungal infections in these patients with cirrhosis. So that's why it's very important for us to carefully monitor in whom we use antibiotics in general and specifically in those patients with cirrhosis who come to a hospital multiple times and get several instrumentations. You mentioned in your presentation also that some antibiotics can change the microbiota in a functional way rather than in a destructive way. What is the current research status on that? So what I was specifically referring to in my, comp in my uh, presentation was the role of rifaximin, which we have for long thought of as a non-absorbable antibiotic. Antibiotic for non-absorbable means that it stays in the gut and less than 1% of it is absorbed into the systemic circulation. However, in the research that we found, we found that it was more than just an antibiotic because if we gave it to germ-free animals, which of course have no you know, uh, organisms in them, rifaximin was still able to reduce the ammonia. It also was able to modulate the intestinal barrier in that, uh, in that situation. It also, in humans, improved endotoxin and improved the bile acid profile, which are the functional correlates of the microbiota, but it did not change the microbial composition significantly. This led us to conclude that while this is more than an antibiotic, it is probably something that makes its action by reducing the ab abnormal functionality of the microbiota rather than just killing them or uh, making them disappear. And what is the next steps from those findings? How will those findings be used in the actual treatment of a large scale of patients? So rifaximin actually is being used currently in patients with hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, it is being used more and more in patients who are in earlier stages of liver disease. Um, there are many more trials that are currently ongoing in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and in patients who have not reached the decompensation of cirrhosis. But the current evidence is limited to the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy for which it should be used because it is approved for that and it is clearly associated with reduction in hospitalization and improvement in patient outcomes. The mechanism of why it does it is something for scientists, but right now it definitely improves the outcomes, protect potentially by changing the functionality rather than the composition. You talked about having to press the restart button in descaling antibiotics. Why is that and how could that actually be implemented? So the hardest thing to do is to prevent us from prescribing unnecessary antibiotics because it is so easy for us to write a prescription or in some countries just tell the patient to do, go and buy antibiotics on their own. This is the behavior change that we have to bring in us as clinicians because antibiotic resistance is an epidemic that is going to kill millions of people by 2050 and not enough attention is being paid to this epidemic. In addition, there is very little investment by either governments or pharmaceutical industries in developing newer antibiotics that can counteract these resistance. So the reset button can be two things. One is our behavior in changing the antibiotic prescription strategies, reducing them, and only restricting them to uh, situations that demand it. The second, more literal reset button is certain smaller scale studies in which fecal microbial transplant has been used in actually figuring out, uh, resetting the intestinal microbial milieu, which results in a reduction in the antibiotic resistance genes in patients with uh, severe uh, resistance uh, situations. This is quite obvious in the treatments of Clostridium difficile, but it has very recently also been used in a small study for treatment purely of multidrug resistant organisms. Are there any media awareness campaigns on the way, for example, in India or even here in Europe where patients are actually informed themselves when they should be using antibiotics or not, so that the use is limited on both sides? Basically? You, the, you raise a very important point. 
very few of us have completed an antibiotic course on our own, even if we have been given the antibiotic. The minute we feel better, we stop taking the antibiotic, and that propagates antibiotic resistance. So greater education, not only in countries like India, but in places like USA where I practice, and in Europe uh, where you live, and where a lot of the uh, audience is, is very important, because unless the patients and the caregivers realize how destructive the, uh, the less use of more use or in uh, or uh, less than optimal use of antibiotics is it is more important uh, this is not going to be solved just by the clinicians itself i am not aware of any specific uh, uh, information directed towards the patients but there are certainly a lot of information directed towards hospitals and practitioners and while the patients are in the hospital there is clearly a big demand to reduce or de-escalate de the antibiotic use, but all bets are off when they're outside the hospital and when they go to their primary care physicians. Coming back uh, to the microbiota, what are the future options to optimize it? And do you believe that a greater knowledge of how the gut microbiota is composed will influence not only the treatment, but maybe also the prevention of certain diseases in the future? That is a very loaded and very broad question. <laughs> yes, of course, microbiota are critical to our understanding of many diseases. Bringing it back to liver disease and especially cirrhosis, in patients with cirrhosis, the, there is a collapse in the microbial diversity. On top of that, we add proton pump inhibitors. On top of that, we add rifaximin and other non-absorbable and uh, other absorbable antibiotics, and it becomes a total mishmash of a million things competing for the patient's uh, nutrients and uh, microbial extraction. So. We, do, we definitely believe that the more knowledge we have in the microbiota, the better equipped we will be in part one, knowing which antibiotics to give to which patient, part two, knowing whether this antibiotic is working quicker rather than the clinical signs, and part three, to find out when not to give antibiotics, when it's not going to impact. So all those are research strategies for the future, which are going to be very, very important for these patients. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>